Yeah, I kind of just added one up there. So we started from the bottom here. And um, the, uh, I'll read the verse again, kind of give us the context. And this next piece is for the context. So we have the two witnesses here. Um, uh, I was given a read uh, like a measuring rod and was told, go measure the temple of God and the altar and his worshipers. And, the, and the, that rod is actually kind of a, the word, actually a staff. He's told by the mighty angel in the previous chapter. And there are thousands and thousands of wor uh, worshipers here, and they're all Jews, and they're all unbelievers. Okay, that's kind of funny. And the reality is that they're the ones who built it. Built it. And um, so, and, and the other part, the word staff, it's like a measuring staff, so it's like a yardstick is what it is. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a rod that's used for a measuring device. That's what it's supposed to be for. And um, the angel's telling him to go out and he, telling him to measure the temple and, his, and, his, and the altar and its worshipers. So he's, he's giving us three very specific things. The temple itself, um, if you kind of remember what that looks like, um, and there's a piece that's going to be excluded in the second verse, but in the first verse it looks kind of like, uh, it's kind of like this, if you have to look at it. It has different look. This is the part that, that's the Gentile side. <coughs> and this is the, where the uh, women are allowed to go. And uh, this is the temple where the priests are. And remember, this is the Holy of Holies back here. There's the um, priest of the EST, and then the showbreds here, and the menorahs here, and the altars right here. And the throne in heaven would be here, but this is the, this is the, kind of gives you an idea of what it is. We've gone through that more than a few times. And, um, but it doesn't appear from this one that this would exist, because it's not mentioned. But it tells us, tells me more or less to exclude this one from the measurement, and then it'll tell us why in chapter 2, leaving just, and this one doesn't even seem to show up, so it seems to be just this. And this is the tribulational temple. Uh -huh. okay. And that's the significance of it. Um, we actually know that there's, um, we know some things about this one. There's actually in Ezekiel, there's actually some measurements of this one. Okay. And we know the measurements are there. We don't really know if it's this one or one that's extended from this one. We know that it's, it's the one that's in the millennium. Um, so where we left off, let me see, we said to, to give them a surveying instrument and compared it to like a, a measuring rod for that. And he says, and someone uh, told me, he gives, he gives them two commands where he tells them to go up. And he's talking to John. He says, the first one is to go up, and the second command, and these are in the command voice, and they're to measure. So he's, he's telling him very specifically uh, to measure. Now, we know now that the, this very spot, if you were looking at uh, Deb's pictures, you saw um, what a, you had an idea of, uh, that the Temple Mount is right here, right now. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, the, the Temple Mount is right on top of the, the uh, Dome of the Rock. Dome of the Rock? Yeah. It's, which is where the, where the mosque is at. Okay, so it's going to be something. But it's interesting, this is called, if you, if you look on the internet, you're looking for this one, this one's called the Third Temple. Okay. There's actually lots of stuff written about it already. There's mm -hmm. guides to it, what it's going to look like, all kinds of stuff. It hasn't been built yet, but there's lots of stuff already written on it because it's prophecy and, and people are trying to uh, kind of uh, move it along, especially the Jews are trying to move this temple to be built, but in reality... Block yeah, a little bit of a stumbling block. So we'll see if that uh, ends up being a war of some sort, or how that goes. But we do know there's a problem there. Huh? Um, so this is the tribulation one, and when what will be in it is all these all these things that are in it here will be put into it too. So it, it'll have all the same furnishings. Uh, it'll be virtually a duplicate as far as they can get it of the uh, of the uh, of the second temple, which is called is many times called. The second temple, we've already gone through this. The second temple is mostly called the Herod's Temple. Okay. And um, it's a little bit different than the second temple, uh, the real true second temple, which is um, built in 516 BC. This is the one that was put together by Zerubbabel. C E R A B B. There's a U in there. U. Like that. Zerubbabel. And you remember who he was. 
Um, that was in 516, and then what happened is Herod extended it and built things onto it after that. So, and then we have the first one, right? And that's Solomon's. Solomon's temple. That's the very first one. And then prior to that, we had the tabernacle. Um, so it has all the same things, and, and, and what's interesting is that, uh, and this is really an important piece of doctrine to remember, is that it was built, all these things are built by the description that's in the scriptures, but in reality, uh, from our point of view, they have no spiritual significance, okay? Because they're built by unbelievers, mm -hmm. you know? They're built uh, by ritual, okay? And so um, the ecumenical world religions that you have um, and it, Judaism, will have no difference in them, okay? Does that make sense? Even today, the, uh, the Jews and the, and, the, and the worshipers who believe in God are not believers in the true God. Okay? And, and we know that because, how do, you, how do you know? What's the acid test for that? The doctrinal point. The acid test, if you do not believe in the Son, you do not believe in the Father. Okay? Their Father, even though they don't think it is, is because they reject Christ who is their Father. Satan, that's right. That's, he's the father of all lies. So, and the reason I tell you that is because a lot of things, um, the doctrines that are taught, that I teach you, um, over and over and over again, I say them over and over again, what they do is they help you rightly orient yourself. Okay? Um, and I'll tell you one of, the, one, of the, one of the things that happens in this country is that we have a lot of believers saying, oh, I can't wait till the temple's being built. Oh, it's like, it's, I mean, nothing's going to change with that. What happens is, is you get caught up with, with all this hooey-pooey, okay? It's a technical word, hooey-pooey. Um, you get caught up with it, but there's no reality to it. You know when that temple will have reality? The second, that's the second coming. That's when it will have reality. Prior to that, it has none, okay? And so it's important to, to discern those things because you have to be able to use doctrine to apply them. Otherwise, you end up with that whole group of idiots who do that stuff, Okay? And, and there's a lot of people get swayed into it. It's, it's very easy to get pushed into it. And when you hear it, it sounds really good. And what you're supposed to be doing with that is, it's, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of say, it's okay. It's better if you're not pulled into it. But if you are pulled into it, it's doctrine that should take you out of it. Does that make sense? Um, when, when you hear this kind of stuff, when you hear all these weird things that come up, uh, because you know, you know the principle of the, of, of the rapture is, is the rapture is imminent. Okay? And the word imminent means it can happen at any time. Paul, if you read, if, if you don't understand that, many times when you hear Paul talk about the rapture and Peter, they won't make sense to you. Because the first thing you'll ask is that, why is he saying it's soon? It's not soon. It's been 2,000 years. He's wrong. No, he's not wrong. The translation is incorrect. The word means not near, it means eminent. Okay? It means it can happen at any time. There is nothing preventing it. Now back in their time, whatever it was that Paul saw, he saw that the rapture could happen just like that. He, he, he looked at the doctrine and he said, and said there's nothing missing. Okay? And then um, 30 years later, 20, 20, 25, 26 years later, when John was written in the book of Revelation, John stood there and said, there's nothing missing. missing. It's eminent. Okay? So you can see what happens. What does that mean? It means that when we look at events, they don't tell us that the rapture is coming. Okay? Why don't they tell it? Because you have the doctrine of the eminency. Okay? If Paul wrote him at the scriptures and says, they can happen any time, there is no prophecy waiting, mm -hmm. then there is no prophecy waiting on any day for 2,000 years, nor is there any today. It's a, it's a doctrinal orientation point. And the requirement you have as believers is to use doctrinal orientation points to orient yourself. Okay? Otherwise, you're swept away by all the goofy stuff. That makes sense? So it's really important to kind of put those little pivotal pieces in there. Uh, and what they should do, and, and I see them sometimes when I hear them, is I see, I see that when somebody hears them, what they'll do is that they're not sure, but they'll ask me a question. You know, the question will be, that doesn't make sense, does it? Isn't it this? And what they do is they state the doctrine. And it's like, yeah, that's it. That's the part you use to orient yourself properly. Okay? Um, you know, I, a lot of times I think about that. A lot of times I criticize some of the things the church is doing today. Okay? And, and I'll tell you why that is. It's, it's important for us to criticize it. Okay? Um, 
There's two things that the church does not do today as, as its mainstream of Bible doctrine. Okay, It does not show that the filling of the Holy Spirit is, is everything. Everything. If you, if, you, if you are not filled with the Holy Spirit, nothing you do counts for anything. Okay? Because that's the power of God. Okay? Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit. Okay? That's written by Zechariah. Okay? Zechariah. That's, a, that's, a, that's like back in this time. So it's like 2,500 years ago. Okay? And then Bible doctrine. What happens is we get taught, we get preached about a lot of stuff. The Bible doctrine is where, where, where everything ends. It is the cutting point. It is the only thing that allows you to discern. When Psalms, when that Psalms I read you two weeks ago, it says, I hold my word above my name, which means it's the first, it's the first orientating point. It's the very first one. If you don't meet this criteria, everything else is worthless. Okay? And then the two that drive these two together is relationship. Right? That's a real, that's a one to one relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ by that's the oriented point. Those are the three. Those are the three axioms of the church. They are everything. Nothing survives. You can have everything else, and if these aren't your points, you've missed the point. Okay, and 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 the point today is that it is Satan who continually tries to blind us and step us aside. And he can do that if we don't have these. That makes sense? If you don't have these, he moves you aside. He makes he he allows people like I'll just get right in trouble. He allows people like Catholics to think that they have that they're holy, that they're okay, that everything's gonna be fine. Okay? Even without this. It allows Mormons to do it. Okay? And every other religion that does not have this as Christ as its basis and the Holy Spirit. So, in reality, these are satanic. That's what this tells us. Okay? Because their basis is the Word of God and the truth of the Holy Spirit. That's how you know. If you don't use those orienting points, and that doesn't mean you sit there and you poke, you know, and, and you, unless you have, unless you're bored. <laughs> That doesn't mean you, don't, doesn't mean you, you, you poke fun at, at, at Catholics. I'm not poking fun at them. I'm just saying they don't fit this test, which negates them by definition. It has nothing to do with it. I like them or not. It's none of my business. All I know is that because I know these two, these two are canceled. They, they are satanic by definition. Um, Muslim is. Why? Same reason. Buddhist. They just, just keep going down. It has, nothing to, it has nothing to do with them being nice people, sweet people, kind people. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with doctrine. Is that you were lost because Jesus Christ, you don't have faith in him. And you do not follow the word of God. It's that simple. Nothing else. So, that's your Christmas message, by the way. <laughs> Merry Christmas, right? <clears throat> so, if you hear me criticize that, it is that I, when you tell the truth you are put in a position of telling that truth, whether you like it or not, okay? It's not, it's, not, it's not personal, it has nothing to do with love. It is true love because you tell the truth, God's truth, okay? So no matter, if all the PC police in the world don't like it, it doesn't make any difference. It's God likes it, he gives you that star because you've spoken <coughs> his truth and you've stood for it. Does that make sense? So that, that's, that's the whole thing. Um, and that's why these people in this thing right there, even though they have this temple, Oh, temple of God. Ooh. Okay? This, this is a demonic temple. And it's used that way until the second coming. It's demonic. Okay? It's demonic today. Okay? It doesn't mean we don't pray for Israel. It doesn't mean we, we are called to pray for Israel because they are God's people. God wants to, them to come to Him. We, do not, we know that they will only come individuals. Um, and guess what? As Jews, when they hear and they have faith in Christ, are they Jews anymore? No. Where are they? Christians! They're not gone. Okay? They're Christians. Okay? And that tells us that in reality, they may want to be Messianic Jews. They may have, they may have all. 
You're as if, once you're a Christian, you're as you're as much a Jew as you are a Gentile. It doesn't make any difference. There's no Jews, no Gentiles. Okay. Um, the same thing's true with everything. Okay. Um, you may have come to Christ as a Filipino, but in reality, you are not a Filipino anymore. You are a Christian. Okay. There are no white Christians. There's no brown Christians. There's no black Christians, red ones or yellow ones. They're all Christians. Okay. Uh, and so you have to be careful with the same thing. What happens is you have a messianic, called a messianic Jew, that's what they call it. They're not a messianic Jew. They're a Christian. Okay? All that stuff, until the second advent, means nothing. And guess what? For them, it will never mean anything. They will never be a Jew again. Ever, ever, ever. And if they understood the scriptures, they would never want to be one. They want to be a Christian because the greatest advantages in all history come to Christianity. How do you know that? This man right here, he is my brother. Everything he has, I get. Everything. I have standing with him. That means that when the Father sees me, he sees me the same. I have complete standing. Everything he inherits is mine. Eternal life. Everything. Election. Predestination. All the riches and all the wealth of all the universe forever. Guess what? It's mine too. Okay? Nobody on either side of history has, has that. Nobody does. So why would you want to be a Jew when you could be a Christian and have this as, as my brother? My personal brother. Him and I. Not collectively. Mine. Okay? Yours. That's the whole point. So these people are demonic until the second advent when they come to know Christ and Christ is their Lord and God, and He is the King of Kings, at the second advent, and the Lord of Lords, and He becomes their King, and then this will be converted, and the, and the Holy of Holies won't need a Shekinah glory, because Jesus Christ will be that Shekinah glory when He reigns. Okay? So, that must be like a Christmas number two. Um, so we, we know what this thing is, and we know it has all these things, because what, what's going to be interesting here, we're, we're going to find out from these two witnesses, I'm just going to give you a piece of it before we go, what, what these two witnesses are going to do is that they are, they are in this temple. They don't leave it. Okay? Three and a half years. Okay? They teach what all that is. Every piece of article in there has a purpose and a meaning. And all, every single one of them are related to Jesus Christ. And they, will, and they will tell the Jews that over and over and over again. And they come there at the abomination of desolation right afterwards. Because at that time, it has been taken over by the Gentiles. But these two witnesses, they will not be able to get rid of. Okay? And that message that they teach is for the Jews. Okay? Um, just like the 144,000 okay, who teach, even though their message is to the Jews, it's an evangelistic towards the Jews, um, and we know that because the 12 tribes are emphasized, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that Moses and Elijah, even though we adopt them in reality, they are, they are Jews. Okay? They're still going to be Jews. In the second coming, they're going to be Jews. They're always going to be Jews. Mm -hmm. They're never going to be Christians. Okay? And, um, and so their message will be there. But guess what happens when, when somebody talks about Jesus Christ, when a Jew talks about Jesus Christ to the Jews, and the evangelists talk to the Jews, guess what happens? You have all these little Gentiles all over the place. And they become proselytes. That's what, that's what it's called. They become Gentile believers. Okay? And there's lots of them. Millions of them. Okay? In reality, when we cross to the rapture, there will be only two people in existence from this biblical point of view. Gentiles and Jews. No Christians. All gone. And these differentiations will not take place. Uh, they will take place. They'll be there. Just like they were before the age of, of the church. So, these will be proselytes. They will hear the message, just like people before in the, in the age of Israel heard the message, and they became believers. And if you're familiar with them, um, the, the, there are many, many Gentiles who show up in the Old Testament in the age of Israel who are believers. They're all over the place. If you remember when, uh, when um, Moses took the Israelites out. There's, there's Gentiles all over the place. You know? and if, you, if you don't pay attention to it, you don't see them, but they're mentioned because the, the focus is Jew, Judaism. It's Jews. But in reality, that grace spills over. Right? Remember the Samaritan woman? She wasn't a Jew. Right? She wasn't a Jew. She wasn't a half-Jew. She wasn't a Jew, period. 
because in reality the Samaritans were just people who were moved over. They were not necessarily um, part of that. They, they had mixed into it. Um, so in reality, she was a believer, a, a proselyte, and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we know that from the, from the context of that one. Now what's happening now is, is the part we talked about before is um, right here. The reason that they miss this piece right here is because of the uniqueness of, of, of Jesus Christ. And we talked about it last week. They, they, the Jews easily, in this context, we're talking Jewish context, these verses, okay? They definitely identify the Alpha, right? They know who the Alpha is. Hopefully you're following that one. That, that's the, that's the, uh, the Lord, okay? That's Adonai, okay? Uh, they follow that. They grasp it. What they didn't understand was that there was going to be an Omega, okay? And this means the beginning, and that means the end. That the Lord became something different, right? He became the Lord Jesus Christ. He became a man, Okay, they were the same. They didn't get this part. This is the final stage of Jesus Christ. That's why it's called the Omega. Omega meaning the end. Final result. He will always be the Omega. He will never be a time when Jesus Christ is not a man and God. Okay, a God man. Never be a time. So they didn't recognize this. And like I said, we've talked about it before on Deuteronomy 6.4. Every Saturday they say this. Um, that the Lord God is... is, is uh, they say he is one, and talking about this is the one they're talking about. What it means is that he's not one, he's unique. Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, is unique amongst the Godhead. Okay? How is he unique? A hypostatic union, right? Son, second person, Jesus Christ the man. That's unique. No other, no other person in the Godhead is like that. Okay? That makes sense? Okay, so you have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They are not unique. They are just like they've always been. The uniqueness, in order to die for our sins, had to have this take place. And this is His uniqueness. This is the Omega. This is the unique. The Lord God is with us. He is unique. Not one. Okay? It means one, they, it should say one of a kind, but that's not how they, how they did it. Um... What we have here is that, in reality, who is building this, we don't know when this ta happens, because this is a piece in history that we really can't follow, okay? It's really dif difficult for us to follow it, because it's future, okay? You know this part, right? You know that part. You know the rapture, right? You know the abomination. Uh, we know the second coming, right? We know that part. We know the thousand-year reign of Christ, and we know eternity. End of time. Happens right there. All done. All done. Finished. And we're somewhere over here. Okay. Meaning that we don't know where that's at. Okay. And so what we have, who builds this, um, is is the um, is the one is one of the dictators. Okay. At least everything, the, all the contacts we have now makes us believe that it's the dictator who is the one who takes that over. Um, and this is the dictator. This is not the, um, this is not the Gentile dictator. This is the Jewish, <coughs> the Jewish dictator. Like I said, many Christians believe there is just one Antichrist. There are two of them. Okay? Um, and he is called, technically, the false prophet. Right? P-R-O-P-H-E-T. Uh, He's a false prophet. He is also the false lamb. Because what he is, um, what he is trying to be is that he's trying to be the Messiah. This is the part where it says, we found the Messiah, come out, come out. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, and tells you not to listen to them, if you remember Matthew. So he is the one who does that. He builds it falsely. Okay? And where we're at right now is we are crossing the piece here where... Um, where we're coming into the, into the two. So what happens is, this happens over here. Somewhere over here, the false prophet is on his own. Okay? The, false, the dictator. This is at the second half of chapter 13 of the Revelation. There's also the Antichrist. Most of it call, call it the Antichrist. It's actually in proper term. Uh, this is the king of the West. Right? 
He is the one that comes out with all the answers and the miracles after the rapture. Okay. This is where the 144,000 are. Okay, and they are prophesying. Okay, so the, the collaboration happens between him and him right there. Okay. Right at that point right there. That's the agreement. And it's a simple agreement in that if you can see where Israel is at now as a false prophet, you can certainly see um, oops, squeeze him out of there, sorry about that. You can see where he is at. Um, essentially he looks he, he's trying to establish this kingdom and he does. He is the ruler, absolute uh, ruler. He, he, he does have a um, uh, an interesting part. He takes on the civil part and he takes on the spiritual part, right? Because that's what the Lord Jesus Christ says. So he takes over both of them. And he is the leader. Uh, the problem is he's an unbeliever. Not only that, but he's actually a demon possessed in reality. And he's looking around to the, well, he's looking to the north, south, east, and west, and there's power blocks all over the place, and none of them are friendly to him except, guess who? <coughs> the king of the west. Why is the king of the west friendly to him? Because the king of the west. And you don't, talk, you don't hear much about this. The king of the West, um, which is the Antichrist, is the, also the um, spiritual leader for what we would call ecumenical religion. Which means generalized. It means everybody's, we're all, you know, the coexist? That's ecumenical. Okay. Um, we all love each other. Can't we all just get along? Okay. Problem is if you have a true truth, and we do, we don't get along. <laughs> That's what happens. Um, and so you have this. And he, at this point in time, is perfectly willing to accept all religions into him. So he sits there, and everybody else hates them. So the king of the West sits there and says, come under, we're, we're going to be buddies. Okay? We'll, we'll be friends. Okay? And the false prophet accepts it, and it goes all the way down to this point right here. Right there. Here. I love Jews, I love their religion, Judaism, that's just wonderful. Let me help you build your temple. Do whatever you want in that temple. Have your sacrifices, do what, they, do what your God tells you to do, right? What happens in the middle? He takes it back. He takes it back, right? He ends it. We know that from Daniel. Three and a half years, makes a deal with him for seven years, right? And, the, and halfway through it, he breaks it. Stops the offering. Where's that at? Right there. Okay. And what's he do? He sets up an image of himself. The Antichrist does. Sets up an image of himself. And he sticks it right here. In the Holy of Holies. Why? Because he's the Antichrist. He's the instead of. He's the against. Right? That's what that means. He, he is now going to be the object of worship. Do they complain? God loves us. Okay? We can do everything, but what happens is the offerings get ended. Okay? Offerings get terminated. But you can worship this guy right here. In fact, if you don't worship him, dead. Okay? So this is where he changes right here. Why does he change right here? Chapter 12. We have Satan and the demons getting kicked out, right? Now the worship's now going to come to who? Who's going to be the background for this? We have a uh, king of the west, right? And we have a false prophet. And who are we on? Who are the beast? Get the picture? Who are the equivalents of these? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah. Father. Son, yeah, a false trinity. The false trinity shows up in virtually every single ancient religion that there is. Virtually all of them. Okay? And the one that we're familiar with, we're most familiar because it talks about it, we have uh, El, right? We have Baal, Baal, and we have Asherah. E R T H, something like that. Asherah H. Okay? This is all ancient, and every one of the ancient ones have this, this parallel. Okay. 
and this is the parallel, the, the, the true. So we have that taking place, and this is the object of worship right here. That's the object. Okay. And so they have an agreement, and why is that agreement? It's because Judaism gets absorbed into ecumenical. Okay. So when this happens, there's an important piece here. Remember, what happens to 144,000 who have become believers in that first three and a half years? So there are believers, and they are Jewish believers. Right? And then there's unbelievers, still people who don't believe. Okay? They haven't been evangelized by these guys. Uh, what do these guys do when that happens? They head for the hills. Right? They head for the hills, that's right. Daniel 12. Okay? They flee <coughs> out of Dodge. L-E-E. -E. Do not go back for your coat. That's right. Don't look for your coat. Don't come back for anything. Got to dodge. If, if you wanted to live, run. Yeah. What? Uh, what is it? Uh, Ammon? Moab. And Moab and... The other one. Edom. Edom. Yeah, Edom, Moab, and, and Ammon. That's, right. That's the prophecy of Daniel 12. It tells them where to run. And this is brought up in Matthew 25. These guys stay. Okay? So these guys right here are gone. They flee. They're in the mountains. They're in hiding. They will stay there because they believe the prophecy. And the prophecy is also in the New Testament. It's in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So these are here, and these stay. Okay? And these are the ones that the two witnesses will be talking to. That will be the object. Not these guys, because they're gone. These guys, the ones who are left. Okay, so they will preach to them for 1,260 days, as it says here. So, let me see, where are we at? So these are the ones who are the, kind of the prophets of God. Um, I wrote down, where is that here? So this is, this is the abomination of desolation. This tells us stuff. Um, where we know where we are at, this is the left in the flea, okay? This is where the, that verse comes from. Um, these two right here, just to kind of tell you so we, we're not looking at them, this right here tells you what that religion looks like. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 12. This, it's, called the, uh, it's called the lawless. Okay, the principle of the lawless one. Okay? Um, this is why um, it, it, the God, in reality, is a God of laws. Right? And to be against the law is to be lawless. He will be the lawless one. Okay? He will be the one who does not follow the laws and the principles of the, of the world as, as God designed it. And that is called a lawless religion. It is the one that the Antichrist has specifically right here. This is the one where it, it has, it's called ecumenic religion. I put it here. It is also the subject of Revelation 17 and 18. Okay? It is, it, that is solely written to ecumenical religion, but that will be the religion of the Antichrist. Okay? Um, and this will be the part where it tells them, when you see, okay, we know that part. When you see this take place, leave. Okay, that's the part that Sam was talking about with all the, all the pieces attached to it. This is the flea in the left, okay? This is the religion that we've been talking about. Um, this is the pieces that tells us when it happens, and this is the other part right here, the abomination of desolation. One of the reasons we know where we're at is because you have to understand the prophecy of, of Daniel 9, uh, 24 through 27, okay? Because this, that's the only way you can understand that this is the 70th week. It is the one week where this prophecy of the breaking takes place. Does that make sense? We know that, this, this is a piece before, we know we have, um, what is it, um, I wrote it down so I would forget it. In the 70th week prophecy, we have the first seven, we have 62 sevens, I'll tell you what this means in a minute, and then we have one seven. And if you look at this, this is 70 times seven. Right? That's the prophecy of Daniel 9, 24. There will be 490, there's seven of them. And this right here, these two have already taken place. 
Um, and we've talked about it before. If, and and the, the date says when, when Jerusalem is rebuilt, okay, after the 586, when it is built, when it is rebuilt, from the day of the decree, uh, 69 sevens, sevens or seven years, okay, 69 sevens is, this is lunar time, will tell it from the day of the decree, and that's, I think it's Cambyses who does the decree. It's either him or Longimina is one of those guys. But it's, it's one of the Persian ones. Uh, when they give that decree, exactly that time of 69 times 7, okay, in the years, it's less than 490, obviously. Because 7 times 70 is 490, so it's under that. That'll be the exact day from the decree to the cross. Okay? Exactly. Okay, so there's no, it, it, it's, it's interesting to me, if they, if they had, and this is why the, the, the story of the Magi, I've told you before, why do the Magi know what they're looking at? Who was, who was the head of the Magi? Yeah. Daniel, that's right. So Daniel turned the Persians, and they, was just, they weren't just Persians, they were all Babylonians too, all who were in the Magi, they were the scientists of the time. He told them this prophecy, they looked for the star, the star of Jacob, and they saw the star, because they knew when to start looking. Okay? What they didn't know was where the 70th week was. Okay? Why? Nobody knew where it was at. Okay? It wasn't revealed. Okay? We know where it's at. It's right there. Okay? And this is why the seven voice says, in the middle of the sevens, he breaks the, he breaks the covenant. This is the seven. This is the last seven. That one right there. That's the middle. It's prophesied in 927 of Daniel. So they know where all these are at because that's why they know to look for the Christ. They know when he's going to be born. If they, if they had all the information, which they didn't have all the information, they probably could have nailed it down to the day. Okay? Because there, was a, there are people, there's a book written called The, um, the Coming Prince. And that prince, by the way, isn't Jesus. It's, it's talking about the, the Antichrist. He actually does this entire mathematical thing that goes through the exact day, because that's a historical fact. It's not a Bible fact, it's a historical fact. It's known. And he does this thing down, does the entire thing down, breaks it down by lunar years, which are 30 days rather than ours, which rotate between 28 and 31. <clears throat> but he does it, and he tells exactly when the cross would have taken place, and what he comes up with is about 30 AD. Guess what everybody else comes up with? About 30 AD, okay, when they do it. When they, when they just take the historical events that we're aware of. Um, so that's how that's known. It's known exactly. This, this right here is how we know the truth. Is because this truth is still the... If you don't understand this truth, then you don't know that that hasn't been fulfilled. You're kind of disoriented. Okay? But if you understand it as we've gone through it here, this one right here, the cross took place. It stopped. What happened after the cross, the church, intercalation? And the 69th week is back here. The cross. Nothing goes. This is the church. When the rapture takes place, that 70th week, this one right here that's prophesied takes place. And all the stuff in it starts rotating out. In fact, it actually comes out right into here. This is when Israel comes to accept the Christ. Okay? So, I tell you that so you don't have to look it all up and read it, but it helps you orient that in reality. The, the evidence of that truth, we know for a fact, was written thousands of years ago. We, we, we know uh, we have pieces of the Masoretic text that go back to before the cross, 400 years before the cross. Pretty amazing stuff. So we can look at it, look at that evidence that hasn't been changed, and come to the conclusion of exactly where we're at. Okay? To exactly where we're at in this thing. This is how, and why is that important? Because if you don't know if it's a Jewish, if you don't know this is Jewish, this stuff makes no sense. You can't orient yourself. This is why doctrine is important. It allows you to orient yourself. Are they talking to us? No, we're gone. Okay? Who is the focus of the 70th week of the age of Israel? Israel. Jews, Israel. That's right, Israel. Okay? It's not us. We're not in it. Okay? This is why it has in this piece right here. If you go to the second page, it pretty much covered all that. Go to verse 2. It says, but exclude the outer court, do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. Okay? It's been excluded. Why is it excluded? 
that this piece we're coming into right now with the two witnesses has nothing to do with Gentiles. Okay? And, and, will they be included in the grace if they accept Jesus Christ? Absolutely. They will be. Okay? Um, so it, it's important to remember the orientation, everything, everything falls apart. So you have to, the, the reason I'm bringing this up is that you have to look at the Old Testament, you have to look at the prophecies, you have to put them together in order to understand what this chapter is talking about. This is a very intense chapter of, of Jewish history for us to understand who these two witnesses are, why is the comparison of the olive tree, why is the comparison of the lampstand, why is that all there, and that comes up in verse 3. Um, so let's go to verse 2. Exclude the outer court, okay, and because the Gentiles will tramp on it for 42 months. How long is 42 months? Hey, Mark. How long is 42 months? Just so it happens 142 times 30 equals 1,260, okay? That's the number of days. That's in the next verse, okay? So we know what that is. We know that historically this is a, um, it helps us to confirm. One of the things that I've, I've talked about is that one of the most important things you can do is orient yourself when you see the scriptures give you uh, a hint. Okay? And this hint for us is 42 months. It's 1260 days. It comes up in the next verse. It allows us to tell us where are we? Where does this line up? And the 42 months and the 1260 days come all the time because God wants us to be able to orient ourselves every time, okay? So we go into Daniel in chapter 12, and we know one of the things that sits there and says that it'll be, what is it, 1200, 1290 days. He talks about 1260, 1200, 1290. He gives us an orienting point from Daniel's point of view of this piece right here, of when that takes place, okay? God gives it to us as an orienting point. But if you do not understand some of the pieces, if you don't understand Daniel uh, 9, 24 through 27, prophecy, you're lost. Right? So you have, you, you have to... Um, I mean, if you want to, we can go through all the numbers, but I think you'll take my word, or you can read the book too. But... Uh, but you, can we go through the numbers? Hmm? Can we go through the numbers, actually? Yeah. Throw that kid out. <laughs> um, we'll do that for next week. You can come for that one. Perfect. Actually, <laughs> um, but the uh, I actually have done it. Was uh, I actually did it on Christmas time back about uh, about seven years ago. I thought it was interesting. Not everybody else felt the same way. <clears throat> Where you actually can go through the math of of the actual day, calculate it out. You have to um, you have to consider the fact that that there's zero. Um, so there's, it doesn't, you, you, when you have a zero in the center, you have to add something. Okay, so you have a minus for BC plus for AD, right? So, you have to do some of that stuff. But anyway, it's very, very interesting. What it does do is that God gives us a hint so that we can continually orient ourselves. One of the things that's most confusing about the book of Revelation is people want to put it end on end. It's not end on end. It's on top of each other. Okay? And the orienting point is the 42 months or the 1260. You can take all the Old Testament prophecies and line them up and say, this is going to happen over here, that's going to happen over there. This is what's going to happen. And one of my challenges, shit that I haven't really done yet, is that when I finish Revelation, I will, mark, I will write all of those down so that you can see them together. Every prophecy that has that prophecy in it, you'll be able to look at it and tell exactly all those things happening on top of each other. Because what we see here is we see a focus of a prophetic event of the two witnesses that is very specific to the Jews. It doesn't have to do with us. It has to do with them. But we can also look at some of the, some of the stuff we've looked at before where we had the, the first and second demon assault armies. Remember them? They fit over here too. So in reality, they are happening at the same time that this is happening. Okay? So they, it gives you that complete picture for that last half of what's called the Great Tribulation. Um, the, the, the Greek here says, and exclude the outer court of the temple. This is the tribulational temple. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles and they will trample over the city, um, the holy city, for 
uh, 42 months. And I think this is the part that comes in on Daniel 12. I think it's Daniel 12. Um, 12, 11. Um, this is, this is, this is uh, Daniel doing his prophecy. Daniel's last message. This is after he's seen everything. Okay, and remember, remember one of the things he, he says here in verse 9, Daniel 12, 9. He tells them, everything you've seen in this vision, do not write down anymore. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Because that's stuff, that's the same stuff that John sees, some of the same stuff that John sees. And John's told not to write it. Remember, we ran into that last chapter. So in verse 12 he says, he says, from the time uh, that the daily sacrifice is abolished, and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Okay? Notice this 30 day difference. Okay? We actually don't know why that 30 days there. Okay? What we, what we think about is that, and there's also one that comes right after it, uh, blessed is the one who waits for um, and reaches the end of the 1,000. 335 days. This is the prophecy, okay? I know that. That's an additional 45 days, okay? So the blessings come here, right? And this right here, um, the end takes place here, to the from the time here to there. Um, the thinking is that this is going to be the baptism of fire. This will be the judgment, okay? Means that once once all the unbelievers are wiped from the face of the earth, the blessings of God will be truly consummated. This will be the acceptance of Israel. This one, we're not sure. This might be the second advent. We're not sure very exactly where that is. If there's a period in here when that is. But it's probably the best we can come up with, given everything. But notice that even something written by Daniel, which is 2,700 years ago, um, yeah, is... It still fits the same piece. It tells us where it's going to take place. Um, let me see. So, John is given the same prohibition that he was in the last chapter. He's given a command prohibition by the mighty angel that he is not to measure it. And the reason being is that it's in the outer court, and the outer court is given to the, um, uh, to the Gentiles. And we know mm -hmm. that part of the prophecy will be for the Gentiles to take over and essentially take over. This will be when this guy comes. The Gentiles will take over Judaism. Okay, they will occupy Jerusalem. They will occupy the Holy of Holies. Okay, the only thing they won't be able to do is they won't be able to get, to get rid of these two witnesses. Okay, and we'll find out they'll try. They'll want to. And I think you know some of the some of the history of that, uh, or nice prophecy, it's future. But some of it is that they will pray for them to die. They'll pray for anything to happen to them. Because what happens is the media comes in, we know how this happens, is that everybody in the world will come to listen to these two. Even though it's a Gentile message, they'll have some kind of media coverage that the entire world will see this. And you, you're familiar with some of this. Hopefully you read this chapter before you went into it. Where when these two are killed, okay, at the end, of the 1260 days, okay, we don't have to, when, when, when they are killed by, um, by Abaddon, let's kind of give you a future, what do they do? They have Christmas. They all give each other presents. Yeah, they're dead, they're gone, they're not telling that truth anymore. We're just so happy, happy, happy. <laughs> so, see, there is hope for Christmas, it's just not the one you're thinking of <laughs> uh, for them. But it, it shows you how, um, it, it, it shows you how threatening the truth is. Because all these people, they're not doing anything, right? They're, they're, not, they're not doing things that they could do. We don't know what they do do, but we know they have law. They have the power of the ten plagues. They have the power to, to close up the water. We know that. We'll get to that. But essentially that what, what happens is they're just telling the truth. They're just running this doctrine through day after day. They're explaining all the doctrines of the Old Testament. They're explaining the doctrines of the New Testament. They're essentially talking to the Jews and saying, this is why this is why the showbread here is the bread of life. This is why this is the Holy of Holy, the, the Christ himself with us, which will be the future for Judaism right here, right? God with us, Emmanuel. Okay? He will be with us, with us. Okay. Um, 
It'll be the, the propitiation, it'll be the, the altar, all that stuff will be there. And it'll actually return the, the sacrifices during, during this period too, by the way. Um, uh, and the trampling is the part, I think it's 1130, it's 1130 here, 1131. This is in Daniel 1131. He says, his, this is where it takes place, this, this uh, prophecy here. It says, his armed forces will rise up to, to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifices. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. Okay? That's the prophecy on Daniel's side. Okay, the other part of that prophecy comes right here. Okay? Jesus is the one who talks about it. Let's just cover it for one second. And that's 2515. Um, 2515. 2415. Sorry, I had it right. I just read it wrong. Okay. Um, so when you see standing in the Holy of Holies the abomination of desolation, a direct quote to Daniel, that piece we just read at 1130. Uh, spoken through the, uh, the prophet Daniel, let the reader, let the believer who is listening to this, because we'll be reading this, it exists, understand. Then let those who are in, the, in Judea flee to the mountains. Okay? Let no one go to his roof, don't get his stuff, don't get his cloak. And he, tell, he tells us other things. And he says here, verse 21, this is the confirming piece here. He says, for there, um, for there will be uh, great stress, unequal from the beginning of the world into now, never to be equaled again. What does that tell us? That the most horrible time in all of human history will be right in this 42, 1,260 days. Okay? Now what's really cool about that, the cool part, is that if you are the person who flees because you're a believer and you go to those, you can sit down and count the days down. <laughs> you know exactly what's going to happen. This is the importance of Bible doctrine. Okay? The believers who do not know this and who do not flee will be executed. Okay? Bible doctrine is important. <laughs> so, but the people on the other side, they'll be, they'll be able to time this thing right out. We'll just stay here. We, just have, we have eight more days. It's going to happen in eight days. And they'll be, trust me, they will have this stuff down the fine science. It's not like us where we kind of just go through it. Um, it's a Jewish matter. Okay? That's, that's what's established in here. Um, let me see, what haven't we covered here? Then the inner core, you know who they are. Um, we probably want to establish why these two are who we say they are, okay? Why do, one of the big questions that comes up in this thing is that, who are the two witnesses, okay? Um, they'll say things like, uh, Enoch, you know, they'll, they'll, or they'll, they'll find people who didn't, why, why can't Enoch be one? And what they do is they start referencing people who didn't die. Okay, that's what, that's the first thing. Enoch didn't die. He had a strange one. Um, Elijah didn't die. Remember what happened to Elijah? The chariot, right? Um, who else did? Moses had a questionable one, right? There's kind of some weird stuff from growing up on. But he says very clearly that he did die. Okay. Um, John the Baptist. Okay. They, they list a whole bunch of people. But well, we know Enoch can't be it, right? Why do we know it yet? This is one of the importance of doctrine. Why can't Enoch be it? Enoch is a Gentile. He's not a Jew, right? He's not a Jew. Why isn't he a Jew? When did Judaism come into effect? Who's the father? First Jew is Abraham, right? I, he was both a, Abraham was both a Gentile and a Jew, right? <laughs> Yeah, for the first patent, for the first 90 years of his life, he was a Gentile. Actually, yeah. I think the first 100 years of his life. Mm -hmm. And then he became a Jew. Okay? okay? And that corresponds with his son, Isaac, right? Who's a Jew. Mm -hmm. Boom, boom, just like that. Race created by God. Okay? So, we know that he can't be it because he's not a Jew. Okay? Now these are the other two possibilities. We, we know it really can't be John the Baptist because of, uh, we do know who it is. We'll come back to this as to who it is. But the answer lies, and Jesus actually tells us himself. Let me see, where are we at? Oh. 
right here. The answer's right there. Okay. We'll come back to that, to, to three. But in reality, Jesus tells us who these are in, in, um, in Matthew 17. And so we'll establish these once and for all. Next week, we'll start out with that. Spend five minutes to prove to you who they, who, who they are. So you never have to have a question about them. Okay? Um, and I'll just give you the hint up front. Who shows up in the Mount Transfiguration? Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah, right. Very, very specifically. And, and the idea of the Transfiguration is to show the three apostles that is with him, his closest three, what, the, what he will look like and what the kingdom will look like when he shows up at the second advent. Okay, which is what the, the glowing part is and all that stuff like that. I was one more thing, though. Hmm? Peter says, oh, it's good for us to be here with you and Moses and Elijah. Jesus did not correct him and say, no, this is not Moses and Elijah. He, yeah. Well, he even says it later on. Yeah, yeah he, 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 they're identified. That's exactly what they are. Yeah, he, Jesus did not correct him. Right. So. And it's consistent with every other piece of doctrine. It's also consistent with what we come up with in verse 3 this one here, um, as to the roles that they fulfill, okay, uh, with respect to the two olive trees and the, the two lampstands, which we'll cover next week, so, let's, um, let me see, I don't think I have anything, we can go to verse 3 next week, but we'll cover, we'll start with um, this piece here to identify exactly who they are, let's pray, Dear us gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your great love for us. I pray, Lord, that we will always, that if we understand nothing else about this, is understand that the orientation of understanding of your principles are always in your doctrine. They are the orienting part. Without them, we're lost. We may be Christians and saved, but we were lost without it. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to take all the doctrine we can in, and then when we fail, reorient ourselves to it over and over again. So we may actually do your plan in our life. I ask this in Jesus' holy name, who did exactly that. Amen. Mm -hmm.